Hi, Pastor Bob Yandian. I want to ask you a question. How do you pray? What do you pray for? Mainly for sickness, mainly for some finances, some other needs. But you know what Paul prayed for more than anything else? He prayed for others, those he led to the Lord, those he instructed in the Word of God. We're going to talk today about the importance of praying for other people from Ephesians chapter 3. Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Glad to have you here today. You know, the broadcast just seems to be increasing, more and more people watching, commenting. And so, you know, if you have any comments, please send them to us and, you know, tell us what you believe about the broadcast or anyway, just things that have impressed you or things you've learned from it. And so that's just really what makes my day. And it's not me, you know, like I said, you know, the broadcast here that I'm preaching to you is what God gives to me. And yes, I have a gift, but the gift comes from God and I enjoy ministering to people. But it seems like the gift that God's given me is just the love of making complicated things now simple. And that's what we're going to be doing today. I want to read a couple of uh, testimonies that have come in. This one's from Beth, and she commented. She said, I just love your teaching. Well, thank you, Beth. Linda commented and said, I love your teaching and the presenting of it. You do it so well, easy to understand. So that's my goal, but I trust that you understand, too. That's God's goal. It's what made uh, Jesus so important. He just he just connected to common people in the street. And Paul did the same thing, even though he was highly educated. He con- com- uh, connected to the people that were in the street the same way with Peter, others that wrote in the New Testament. This is God's concern and God's desire is to speak to people in ways they can understand it. So that's what our broadcast is about. Today, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter three. We're going to take a look at verses 14 through 21. And I simply ask you this question before we get into it. How do you pray? I mean, and when do you pray? Most people would probably tell me, well, you know, when I'm sick, I pray. When my kids are sick, we pray. When we have a financial need, we pray. Do you ever pray beyond that? I mean, do you ever pray for just the general things of God in your life and how they operate, open doors, things like that? I'm going to take another step. Why does most of your prayers revolve around you or your family? How often do you pray for someone else? Pastors, how often do you pray for your congregation? Paul did this here in the book of Ephesians and also Epaphras in Colossians, who was the pastor of the church, prayed for his people. How often do you pray for them that what you preach will be captured inside of them, revealed in them and change their lives? Most of us pray for ourselves and most of us pray mainly for two reasons. Number one, we need money and number two, we're sick. And our family is the same way. We pray for them for the same thing and those close to us. And oftentimes we don't think about the people that we are ministering to. And Paul did. In fact, Paul very rarely prayed for himself. He did one time. He even asked the Colossians to pray for him, that he he would be able to make it simple. That's the gospel, that their hearts would be open. He would be able to connect with them and that they were to understand they were partners with him in the preaching of the word of God. Pastors, those people out there that you preach to every single week are partners in your ministry. Pray for them, pray for their success, because even though they lead somebody to the Lord, part of the credit has to come back to you for seeing them saved in your church, educated in your church, brought up in your church, matured in your church. This is what you should be praying for. Their results not only give them awards in heaven, but also give us awards and rewards when we get before the throne of God. Let's take a look at what Paul prayed for the Ephesian congregation here in chapter three, beginning in verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell or be at home in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all. I want you to notice one phrase in there that Paul said in the middle of this prayer. He prayed for them that Christ may dwell in their hearts, and the word dwell means to be at home. Jesus Christ not only wants to dwell in your hearts, he wants to feel at home in your heart, and he enjoys being in inside of a believer through the Holy Spirit of someone who's understanding the word, strives
striving for more of the Word. His desire is to illuminate the Word of God. And oftentimes we only use Jesus, our intercessor, the one we pray through to the Father. Oftentimes we pray only for our sickness or the needs we have. And we look at these temporal needs we have. All those will be gone one day, but the things we grow in and the things of God will be with us forever. This is what Paul prayed for the Ephesian saints not only for those who are in the ministry, but I ask you this, you as a member of a congregation or just as a family that's born again, knows the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit, how often do you pray and what's it for? Again, 99% of the time you're praying for your kids to make a good grade, to remember things that are on the test, and for them again to make friends. We pray for those things and we want them to be successful. Most of our prayers are about ourselves, not for others, so that there can be a spiritual rewards at eternal rewards, not just the reward of a few dollars here or getting healed of a sickness right now. Paul's prayers were based on his knowledge of God's Word and his covenant relationship with God. How different our prayers should sound for ourselves and for others, and they do. We pray for ourselves, and man, we go into some detail. Lord, you see this. You know what they're saying about me. Uh, you know they're threatening a lawsuit. Uh, you know the doctors are saying this. We go into all that detail. But when we lift up others, we should lift them up with the same intensity and fervor as for ourselves. This is what Paul did here in these verses of Ephesians chapter 3 that we should be just as interested, if not more interested, in those of whom we fellowship with in church and in our daily life. Pastors, when you preach a sermon, we often, I can tell you this, I know this from history, is most of the time we want to know, did we preach good? Did it get across? Did the people enjoy it? Did they laugh at my jokes? We go down the things of all the things that we want to come out of that sermon, but the thing we often forget is, Lord, I want them to remember it. Even if I don't think I did such a great job, you're taking the information through the Holy Spirit into their heart. I want to see change in them. Lord, I'm praying that they'll listen to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, nudge them. Father, nudge them and remind them how powerful prayer really is. That prayer can open up the portals of heaven, not only to bless someone else, but to be blessing themselves by understanding the revelation of the Word of God. No amount of money, no healing of any sickness, no better grade on your child's report card could outweigh the fact that you help to change someone else's life in this earth and bring spiritual relationship, leading them to Jesus, getting them filled with the Holy Spirit, or else being able to share a scripture with them that changed their life forever. Ministers, this is what you should be praying for. Epaphras in Colossians, pray that they would understand the Word of God, grow in the Word of God, and that they would come to know the Lord intimately. This is what he prayed for them, and he didn't pray for himself that much. He prayed for them. Most of us, I can tell you this is, I'm guilty of it too. Before a service and before a sermon, we're praying, Lord, help me remember all this stuff. Lord, I want to come across good. And basically we're praying that we'll look good after the service is over. These prayers of Paul in Ephesians were intercessory, made in faith for others and based on scripture. Again, we often pray in our known language or in tongues over situations, but we stop there. We often use the word for healing for ourselves, for our own finances, again, for our own family, our children, our wife, the needs we have. But a doer of the word uses God's word to pray for themselves and also mainly for others. It should be in your life you're praying for others more than you're praying for yourself. Someone that you talk to about the Lord on the job or maybe, you know, as you were traveling, I, I ministered to people on airplanes. And you know, what's my prayer after it's over? My prayer usually ends up being for me and I forget about them, kind of turn them over to the Lord, but I should be praying for them. Lord, I want them to remember what we talked about. I want the hunger of their heart to be satisfied. And Lord, I want most of all for them to say yes to Jesus and accept him as savior. Or if they are a Christian, they'll get closer to him through the things we talked about here in this cabin of this plane. So next of all, unless someone is sick again or in financial need, we usually have no reason to pray for them. But Paul prays for these saints, for their spiritual growth, for their maturity. Here, let me just list some things that Paul prays for saints throughout his epistles. By the Holy Spirit who lives in them, they would increase in inner strength and inner might. 
He prays for them that Jesus Christ who lives in them would feel at home in their hearts, not just live there, but feel like he honestly belongs there. He prays for them they'll be able to gain greater understanding of God's Word. He prays for them they would know the love of Jesus that surpasses all knowledge. Then he prays for them that they could be filled with all the fullness of God. That's a pretty powerful prayer. That's a very wide encompassing prayer, especially that last one. They would be filled with all the fullness of God. In other words, Paul does to say, Lord, as much capacity as they have. He said, Lord, I want them to have absolutely all of it. And I'm praying they're going to reach a point in their life where they'll have all the fullness of God. Now, we know, honestly, that's not going to happen in this life. It's going to happen in eternity. But Paul simply sets the very limit of everything eternally for them right now and says, Lord, I know they're going to learn a lot in heaven, but I'm going to pray for them. They're going to get as much as possible down here on this earth. The next thing that Paul did in this prayer, he started with it, then later on mentions it in other verses of Scripture. He prayed this for this cause. What cause? Well, you have to go back to previous verses at the ending of the previous chapter and find out the cause is the church, the body of Christ. This is the cause. He was praying not only for the individuals in the body of Christ, but he's praying for them to find their place among all believers, that they fit within a church. And the church is not just the physical, local church. It is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, every saint around the world, that we would find out where we belong in the body of Christ, that we would find out what our mission is in the body of Christ. I may have the same call as another pastor. You may have the same call as another evangelist or someone else. You may have the same thing as giving as far as an office of giving. There's these all these mentioned in the New Testament, and Paul is simply saying here, the cause is the entire church, the entire body of Christ. This is the cause of why you're here. You're not here just to live for yourself. You're not here just to have finances to carry you through life. No, you're here to have finances to give. Every one of God's gifts, He freely pours out on us if we have the right attitude, such as finances. It's He that gives you power to get wealth, not just to fall back and rock on your front porch, on your rocking chair and enjoy all your wealth. No, it's He that gives you power to get wealth in order that His covenant may be established, which is in the earth. What is your priority for financial blessing? in this earth. It should be that, Lord, I'll have more money than ever to give to other ministers, to give to other ministries that are out there spreading around the world. Lord, I want to be part of missionary works. I want to be part of those that within the city are helping the poor, but helping them to lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says this, for this cause, I bow my knee unto the Father. I think there's some important things that are directed in this prayer. Our prayer should be to the Father. I know one man, every time he prays, he prays, God, oh God, God, God. And I keep thinking, no, your prayer should be directed to the Father because God speaks to all the members of the Godhead. Your prayer should be directed to the Father in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll continue this when we come back. I have a prayer flash drive that's being offered to you. The announcer will tell you how you can have a copy of it for yourself. And I'll see you right after the break. In Ephesians 6, 18, the expanded translation says, praying always at all times with all prayer, different kinds of prayer, and supplication, that is praying in the spirit. The prayer flash drive presents a biblical explanation of each type of prayer found in scripture, including praying in the spirit, binding and loosing, the prayer of consecration, the prayer of agreement, the prayer of faith, and many more. The flash drive also includes a series on the power of prayer and the prayers of Paul. In studying the prayers of Paul, you will learn that Paul rarely prayed for his own needs. He mainly prayed for others, especially for believers. The prayer flash drive contains 37 MP3 audio lessons by Bob Yandian, a topical study on prayer. To order the prayer flash drive, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Ephesus was famous for reckless living and idol worship. Even so, the Ephesian church was deeply spiritual. Unlike other letters correcting error, Paul's letter to the Ephesians revealed to mature believers both the truth of who they are in Christ and the practical application of this revelation to their marriages, families, and everyday lives. Bobby Andian's New Testament commentary on Ephesians ties in Greek word studies and scriptural references revealing God's empowering grace and the unprecedented authority of every believer as part of the body of Christ on earth. 
To order the New Testament commentary on Ephesians, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Just before the break, I talked to you about we pray to the Father. I want you to understand this is something for the New Testament. They could not pray to the Father in the Old Testament because there was no family of God. There was no God is our Father, Jesus Christ is our brother, the Holy Spirit lives with. None of that existed in the Old Testament. Jesus introduced it in Matthew chapter 5, verses 6 and verse 9, where he said, pray this way, our Father who is in heaven. This was something new. I'm sure the disciples looked at him and many of them who came out of, you know, uh, in the Old Testament came out of the ways of Israel and came out of the Jewish beliefs and Jewish faith and all those different things and under the law. You didn't pray to God as your father. No, he was just God. You might have named a name that attached to him. I pray to God, you know, the one who is always with me. I pray to God who strengthens me. I pray to God who empowers me. All the different names that were mentioned back there for God the Father now has all come under one thing. When you go to the Lord, address the Father and do it in the name of Jesus. So Paul says again here, I I bow my knee unto the Father. All prayer by the believer should be directed to the Father in the church age we live in. Again, the verse of scripture I gave you is Matthew chapter 5, verses 6 and 9. And in this, what we call the Lord's Prayer, Jesus was basically introducing how our ministries were going to change after Jesus was taken into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. At that point, the Son sat next to the Father, and we can now join the Son by being born again and we become seated in heavenly places with him and therefore have the right to address God the Father as our heavenly Father or our Father. And so again, Jesus said, pray this way, our Father who is in heaven. Notice he didn't just say my Father, he said our Father. So all of us as believers have the right and have the privilege, but also the responsibility of coming before God and addressing him as Father. That might bother some of you who pray to God all the time and pray in the name of God. And when you pray that, because you just don't feel like you have any honor, you don't have any right to call him your father. Jesus said you do. And God the Father says you do. Whether we pray for ourselves or we pray for others, we go directly to the Father in prayer. Paul prayed for others more than he prayed any other type of prayer, and he addressed it to the name of the Father. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father. This is our ministry in the New Testament as priests in God's family. In the Old Testament, there was one tribe that was the priestly tribe. In the New Testament, every believer is a priest before God and a priest before our great high priest, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. We also pray in the name of Jesus to the Father in the name of Jesus. Why do we pray that way? Because he is our channel to uh, the Father. He's our mediator to the Father's throne. And just as Jesus could address him as Father, so do we. We also pray in the name of Jesus, again, our channel, our mediator, directly to God's throne. He then went on to say, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. No wonder we can call God the Father, Father. No wonder we come through the name of Jesus, our mediator, who brought us into the family. He says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That encompasses every nation on the earth. He wasn't talking here just about the local church. Although the local church fits within the universal church, it still comes back to this. We address him as father. We approach him in the name of Jesus. The whole family has always been and always will be divided until the rapture of the church. Notice he said, of whom the whole family in heaven 
and earth is named. You're always in the, in the family. At that time, the dead in Christ are going to join those who are alive and remain at the rapture. Together we'll be caught up and in the millennium we'll join those who are born again during the tribulation and the family will be complete. The family will be complete in heaven one day and the family will be complete on earth and heaven one day whenever all unbelievers are removed off the planet. But until that time, our family is divided between heaven and earth. The whole family, it's partly in heaven and partly on earth. Why do we do that? Because in this dispensation we live in, the family's always going to be divided. Now the church only exists on earth. The body of Christ only exists on earth. When you die and go to heaven, you leave the church and you leave the body of Christ, but you never leave the family. And the family is going to be reunited one of these days, as I said. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10 says this, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both our which are in heaven and those which are on earth in him. All the body of Christ will one day be in heaven. All of the church will one day be in heaven along with Old Testament saints. But at that time, we will all become part of the family of God. The family of God are those who are born again and we form the sons and daughters of God. We each claim Jesus as our elder brother. The family is everlasting. I'm going to say that again. The family is everlasting. It's on earth right now and in heaven, but Christ's church and Christ's body are temporary, found only on earth. And then he says next of all about the family, here's what God wants the family to understand, that he, God the Father, would grant to you according to the riches of his glory, these riches of glory that God has given to us are attached to his supernatural strength that's been given to us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of me and the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you are, is a supernatural being that connects us to God himself. Part of the Godhead lives inside of me. You say, well, God the Father lives in you and, and Jesus lives in you. Yes, they do. But they live in me through the presence of the Holy Spirit. So first of all, his rich are attached to his supernatural strength through the Holy Spirit. And what those things bring to us include both spiritual and natural blessings, spiritual and natural benefits. Let me give you some of them. Those benefits that have been given to us only as believers, first of all, Romans chapter 9 and verse 23 says, His mercy has been given unto us. That's part of His riches. That's part of the supernatural strength given to us, and that is the mercy of God lives in us. If we will depend on the Holy Spirit, the very mercy that God has can be displayed through us. Again, that's Romans chapter 9 and verse 23. Next of all, His forgiveness. His forgiveness lives in us. Some Sometimes we forget about him in us and we act on our own and we break out in anger and bitterness toward others. Or somebody comes to us, they've committed a sin the second time or the third time. And the thing we get so upset about it and we start to blow, you know, uh, blow a gasket in front of them and tell them, how can you possibly do this? When all I'm telling you is how many times have you done a sin more than once. And God is so forgiving. God is so merciful. His forgiveness is always there. His inheritance for us, Ephesians 1.18 has been given to us. We not only have been born again, but God has an inheritance in heaven for us, waiting for us. In other words, you think earth is great? The best is yet to come. Ephesians 2, 7, his grace is in us. This is part of those blessings and part of our inheritance we have. His gospel is in us. The gospel is used on earth to help win others to the Lord, and the Holy Spirit empowers that. As when we come before others in faith, I've often said this, and, I'm this, and, and I mean it so strongly, is that witnessing is supernatural. The gospel is supernatural and the Holy Spirit was given to us. We're filled with the Holy Spirit that he can empower the gospel inside of us, present it clearly. And so he said, you know, the Holy Spirit will come upon you to be my witnesses and we need to depend on him. Those signs and wonders of the Holy Spirit are mainly given to us to help win others to the Lord. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, uh, laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. All those things are part of the gospel. 
And the best use of those things is to win somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.19, this is his material benefits. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And finally, Colossians 1.27, his revelations of the mystery of the New Testament. There's so many mysteries contained in the New Testament because the church ages call that dispensation of the mystery. Things that were never revealed in the Old Testament have now been revealed to us And again, this is brought out in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. Are you beginning to understand the power, the equipment that God has given to you to be a blessing to others? And yet most of the time we spend praying for ourselves and for our own needs when we should spend at least 85, 90% of our prayers should be for people we've talked to, people we've ministered to, to come to understand, know the Lord or to become strong in the Lord. Strength given to us by the Holy Spirit is based on two things. Number one, God's abundance of riches that he has to be given. And number two is our abundance of knowledge to be able to handle his riches when he does give them to us. Isaiah chapter 40 tells us in verse 29 through 31 of what God has given us as far as strength is concerned to help us change our own life and then the lives of others. Isaiah 40 verses 29 through 31 says he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might he increases strength. Even the young men and young women shall faint and be weary and the young men will utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I love that uh, that Hebrew word. The word renew means to exchange. We exchange our strength for God's strength. But those who wait on the Lord shall exchange their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So Paul, in essence, what he's doing here in this prayer for the Ephesians is praying in line with God's command to us. Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He knew that. He applied it to his own life, but he takes scripture and prays for others. In other words, what's the use of scripture? Maybe we use it for ourselves. I'm sorry, I keep saying this over and over again, but most of the time we read a scripture and say, I'm gonna use that for my life. Why not use it for someone else's life? That's the reason you're left here on this earth is not for yourself, it's for others. It's to win others, it's to strengthen others, it's to empower others so they can become stronger in the Lord. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 23, Moses gave Joshua a charge and said, be strong and of good courage. He was saying that for Joshua. Most of the time in the word of God, the prayers and the exclamations that they have before God for others so that they can grow, comes back to this, they pray for others. They are more concerned in others than they are for themselves. And Moses is a great example, putting up for 40 years with that group of people that were rebellious against God every day. And the New Testament said they did always complain. They always worried. They never trusted in God. And Moses continued was there to point them back to God. It lasted about 20 minutes and it was over. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 23 says again, Moses gave Joshua a charge and said, be strong and of a good courage. And finally, in Joshua chapter one, verses six and seven, he says over Joshua, be strong and of good courage. For to these people, you will divide the land for an inheritance, which I, that's God the Father, swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. In his closing prayer, he was praying for Joshua, not for himself. That should be your daily prayer praying for other people to grow in the knowledge and understanding of the Word of God. Thanks. I'll see you on the next broadcast. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.